It's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Nalini Shah, a professor and head of endocrinology, KM Medical College, Mumbai. She's a great teacher and excellent speaker who has many national and international publications to her credit and has contributed to many chapters in endocrine books. She is going to discuss a very important topic, test for Cushing syndrome, what's simple and what works. Dr. Shah. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think this meeting is going to be a landmark in its own kind with this kind of science and a great hospitality with a super ambience. I think the organizers have set off a very great benchmark, very, very hard to surpass. Thank you very, very much for making me part of this extravaganza. I think the very question is sort of, uh, if I kind of may put it gently, outrageous. How can Cushing be simple? What will a person like me do if you make Cushing very, very simple? I think Cushing is not simple, but let us just examine over the next 15 minutes what are the sort of data assessments which are available to us and look at this data in terms of its yield and accuracy and just kind of take our call to say what really works in patients with Cushing. So we have this huge set of tests which are usually available to us. I think the logistics, the availability of these tests, none of these are issues anymore in Cushing's patients. I think all over we should be able to access these tests. And what really kind of then transpires is how do we really interpret the data that is generated. And what I'd like to do is just give the nuances of each of these tests as we kind of address them. So when we, as a clinician, look at a test, we are always talking about, is this test sensitive enough or is this test specific enough? And when we try to make a balance between the two, there are sort of things to gain and there are definitely things to lose as you sort of keep on shuffling between different cutoffs. And that's what happens with majority of tests of Cushing syndrome as well. Let me just take you through each of these tests. When you ask for urinary free cortisol, it stands to great logic, great reason. It's an integrated value of 24 hours, and it should truly stand up to the challenge of making diagnosis very, very simple and effective for you. Let me just show you this one very, very basic example of how UFC can give you and pose multiple challenges for you. Of course, its logistics are a bit of a challenge in terms of its collection of completeness of the whole sample. But much more important than that is the sheer day-to-day -day variability which you have in a patient with Cushing syndrome. And anything up to 30% of patients can give you one sample which is perfectly normal. And that's what something which ought to be remembered when you're addressing this test. Nothing short of two to three samples are really going to serve your purpose and you ought to know this pretty pretty well and even in the literature what has been borne out all along is the fact that when you talk about the cutoffs which have ranged from maybe one and a half times two times three times the normal range and now brought down to just upper limit of normal have given you a good degree of sensitivity but there is a compromise and there is a challenge which lies out there in terms of specificity because about 15 percent of patients can generate false positive values and that does become a kind of a concern for management. This is an extraordinarily common test that we use in management of our patients, the dexamethasone suppression. Whether you call it overnight, whether you call it low dose, whichever test you feel comfortable and you want to work with, very good in its logistics, especially the overnight because you kind of address it on an outpatient basis, which is what you want to really achieve in a garden variety of endocrine clinic that we all handle, which is so extraordinarily busy. But can you really kind of have your answers coming through? Look at this girl, typical scenario, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And she kind of comes with an abnormal ODS value to you. Does she really have Cushing? Well, the answer is no. Very much like what Dr. Unni presented in the previous case, it was all part of she being on oral contraceptive pill. Addressing the underlying drugs that the patient is taking is of paramount importance in patients with, when you are doing any kind of dexamethasone suppression test. And this is what happened in this girl. She had an abnormal test, which settled and normalized at the end of two months. So any patient on OCP, you have to repeat the test after a washout of minimum six weeks. It could be more. Same challenge, another kind of drug. 
patient known to us. He was Cushing Cushing. We had managed him, he was cured. And truly, to all these patients of Cushing, you have to monitor them because the relapse rate is so very high. And he relapses. He goes on medical management with ketoconazole and we are monitoring him. We are monitoring to figure out whether he's relapsing. There's a basic mistake which has happened over here. And it's all overnight dexamethasone suppression values are coming very good, very normal, where all along the clinical suspicion says, no, he's cushing. Why are these ODS coming normal? And of course, it was the ketoconazole, which is a major culprit. It completely changes the metabolism of dexamethasone. It slows it down because of interference with CYP3A14 enzyme. And what happens is that you have a suppressed ODS with a urinary free cortisol value which is high telling you the sheer discrepancy which is produced and which is drug induced so when you talk about overnight dexamethasone suppression test through the literature if you keep scanning the history of patients with Cushing's disease and Cushing's syndrome you realize that the cutoffs have changed over the years this change in cutoff from 5 to 1.8 has given you a good deal of capturing of your patients and not missing of your patients, but it has truly compromised on the specificity of the test, which has dropped down from anything up to 85% to about just 80 75%, and that is a major challenge. Does that mean that I can ever use it as a screening test? There's a big challenge out there to say, A, a patient walks into my clinic and I say, are you or are you not Cushing? But another group of patients which are very subtle, maybe they are present and interwoven amongst our type 2 diabetes, poly polycystic ovaries, osteoporosis, and we are trying hard to look at them to say, am I missing, missing Cushing in these patients? And can I use this kind of a test as a screening test in my patient's of a clinic in type 2 diabetes, where I need to have something which is quite specific, I wouldn't be able to handle a false positive to the tune of 20%. Well, in our own data of unselected more than 1,000 subjects, it has stood up pretty well. But I think one single study doesn't really make the story. It is always multiple studies in different scenarios, different BMIs, different age groups is what is going to culminate into answers. So this answer we still don't have. ODS, I think my story would be it is a good test, very simple, very good logistics, but understand and know the challenges associated in its interpretation. We learned somewhere along our way, more than one and a half decades ago, the diurnal rhythm is a great test to work with. And we kind of published our own data, and again, backed with huge data from the literature to say it works very, very well. It's a very sensitive parameter to work with. But look at the data in terms of garden variety of patients out there. The specificity is a huge challenge. It goes down to 20%. Can you and I in our busy departments handle 80% of false positive data? Well, the answer is absolute no. And we then kind of set out to say, can we have something simple in its logistics so that it life gets easier, A, for the sort of faculty as well as for our residents, and yet not lose the specificity? So we kind of came up with the support of literature and learned our way through late night salivary cortisol data. Our data and the data in the literature kind of helped us to understand that yes, LNSC works well, very sensitive, and very luckily doesn't lose the specificity. Good message, good learning curve to come out. Yet it sort of has its challenges because it has not lent itself to automation very effectively. There's a huge learning curve out there and the biggest message that I learned for myself and I thought that was an eye-opener was the fact that the dirty amino assays are more superior compared to the very good benchmark gold standard of an essay like LCMS because LCMS loses its sensitivity completely at the cost of specificity, which the antibody assays don't do. But there is a challenge out there in terms of generating enough data and having it 
lent itself to automation. Also, the sheer physiology between very subtle subclinical Cushing's of an adrenal incident loma is very different. LNSC does not work over there. We need to learn the various caveats associated with spectrum of Cushing's syndrome. We need to stay tuned, but this test seems to be promising, simple, and it probably works very well. ACTH, we love to work with this test, and we kind of learned in a very hard way. The assay is helping us more and more. It's becoming simple. It's becoming very robust, which is a very good part of the story. But do not ask for a cutoff. Don't say, can I differentiate between an adrenal adenoma or an adrenal lesion versus an ACTA-dependent Cushing. The jury is completely open and out there, and there is no number which can give you a hard and a fast rule there. People call it 5 to 15 as a gray zone. Some call it 5 to 30 as a gray zone. You can generate any number in any patient, but Think of it as a useful additional put together with the whole picture and it generates a very useful set of data. Also, don't ask it to differentiate between ectopic Cushing and a pituitary Cushing because even in an ectopic, it has a huge overlap with a pituitary Cushing and the data starts as low, even in our series, right from 50 picogram per ml. Do not ask ACTH this question. Are you coming as a Cushing from adrenal or are you an ectopic Cushing? It simply doesn't have that power. Don't give it that power. Imaging, do not ask for a simple MRI of the pituitary. Gone are those days. We must talk to our radiologist, go through our MRI characteristics, get our menu right, get our ingredients of all menu right over there, and that will allow us a better yield of our MRI from just mere 40 to 50%, anything upwards of 70%. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to tell you how hard it is to struggle with an MRI negative Cushing's disease, because it then goes on to IPSS. IPSS, we always thought of it as a great gold standard, a sort of infallible god, so to speak. Well, not really. Look at this lady. She has this flat-looking IPSS, and ladies and gentlemen, this is CRH-stimulated value. Do not even dare to call and label anybody as ectopic unless you have normalized this IPSS value with prolactin. And this lady, the problem that she had was anomalous venous drainage and not the pituitary being the culprit. She had pituitary-driven Cushing's disease with a flat response on IPSS. Moral of the story, IPSS is not just reading ACTH. It's not just putting the logistic of the test together and generating one number of ACTH. You have to go through this algorithm, though it is just an example. This is not a hard number, but do not even think of calling somebody ectopic without understanding the physiology of what can go wrong with IPSS. Well, do I really need to look at this science beyond all these factors and look at the differential splicing of ACTH, whether it'll be different in pituitary-driven vis-a-vis ectopic ACTH secretion? Again, this is a science which is getting revived, and I I'm one who's told myself, I'm going to work with this. I'm going to stay abreast with this. Imagine just in blood picking up something which is different than your usual splicing of POMC molecule, which is going to tell me this is ectopic. My life would be made, and I think this is a great science which is going to emerge. And the same thing, constantly we as an endocrinologist fight our way through clinical picture biochemistry, functional imaging, get something lighting up for you, and then attack it anatomically. Why don't we do that for our little pituitary? The little miss pituitary, we studied with CRH-stimulated FTG PET-CT. 
we just have initial phase of data, but that has not shown us the way. We need to kind of probably refine our concept, our methodology. I don't know, maybe we can hit something and figure out that invisible adenoma. I don't have to tell you what a big deal that would be. Mother of all, cortisol. We are always looking at cortisol in our patients with Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome for that matter. Can you tell me in this girl who is Cushing's disease gets operated on day five with a super duper value to tell you, oh, she's cured, comes back to you for reassessment because to me, reassessment of Cushing is the only way to tell whether they are cured and not this day five cortisol. Look at her value at three months. Look at her diurnal rhythm at three months. As she starts reviving her access, her three month value which gets noted is completely abnormal. Ladies and gentlemen, this lady was never cured. This is a persistent disease. And today we do not know one basic fact of life. How do we define cure in Cushing? Is it really cortisol? Is it post-op highest value of ACTH? Or is it CRH stimulated ACTH? We don't know how to define a minimum disease burden. And all sort of jungle goes out there to say, is this Cushing? Is it cured? Is it recurrence? To my mind, many of these are persistent disease with residual minimum disease, which cannot be detected in our tests, which are available to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, what is simple and what works in Cushing? If I was to answer to this organizing committee and our scientific chairman, to my mind, there is only one thing which works the sheer experience of managing different spectrum and length and breadth of Cushing's syndrome patients. The experience is the mother of all, which teaches you how to interpret your data and not generate some numbers on paper. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time.